in major cities all over the world, anti-Israel hate rallies were held on August 18th under the banner of International Al-Quds Day. But here in Toronto, one man opposed them. One man called Mayor Weinstein, head of JDL, organized a countergroup to protest. Also, later on, Dr. Uri Leviathan, the world-renowned expert on the kibbutz, to talk to us about the kibbutz, an integral part of kibbutz society, of Israel society. But is it dying? Is it dead? What's really happening today with the kibbutz? And finally, two comedians, Howard Dover and Jean-Paul. I'm Doris Epstein, and this is Mensch Life TV. And now, meet Mayor Weinstein. You, single-handedly, with your group, organized a protest on Al-Quds Day. Let's see a, a, a bit of what happened. Okay. Here it is. Animal man, stand with me, I'll see who will stand. Ah. That, that's, that shows that, that shows that who is animal. That shows who is animal. That shows who is animal. How many days will you kill today? Yes, yes, you shall be stoned to death. They're saying lots of nice racist things. I want to send it. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna try to send all these videos claiming that we were. This guy's saying lots of lots of bad bad things. You know what I mean? Okay. Tell us about it, and tell us about International Al Quds Day. Certainly. Um, let's start first with what uh, Al-Quds Day is. Al-Quds Day was created by the Ayatollah Khomeini. And uh, the purpose was to call for the destruction of Israel. And there are rallies organized throughout the world by organizations that uh, back the Iranian regime and uh, try to push that agenda to encourage people to push for the destruction of Israel. That's exactly what uh, was taking place at Queen's Park on August 18th. And to add insult to injury, it was at Queen's Park on government grounds. It was at Queen's Park. Uh, Dalton McGuinty, the Premier of Ontario, uh, permitted uh, the grounds to be used for that purpose. It's an obscenity that uh, the grounds should be used for the and purpose Jewish of calling. And Jewish organizations fought like crazy. Yes, they, they did. They sent letters. They had meetings. Yeah. And it, 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 I think we're most shocked that it was permitted on government grounds. Yeah, uh, it happened last year as well at uh, Queen's Park. Uh, the language uh, was, in fact, more vicious last year. But still, the same message resonated. Destroy Israel. That's what they called for. Expel the Jews from Israel. And your group was the only one that was protesting. We put out the call. And, uh, you know, we're, we built a coalition of uh, various organizations that joined us. One organization that joined us was a group of Iranians, uh, that uh, pro-democracy Iranians that are anti the regime in Iran, and they support Israel. Remember, at one time, uh, Iran had warm relations with Israel, and there still are a significant amount of people in Iran that would like to uh, go back to the time when we, had, when we enjoyed warm relations. So they were with us side by side calling out the, uh, the Khomeini's there with us to uh, confront and expose. How many people showed up? And it was Shabbat. It was Saturday. It was Shabbat. It was... And you're an observant Jew. How did That's you get right. around that one? Well, I didn't walk all the way from Thornhill. I stayed downtown. And, uh, you know, we had sufficient notice. So um, I think, uh, you know, nobody has a proper excuse not to miss uh, such an event. Accommodations can be made downtown. And there are shuls downtown for those that are observant like I am. Uh, also, the um, fact is, uh, the majority of Jews don't really observe Shabbat. So if they're going about their ways anyways, uh, they have an obligation to be there anyways downtown. And uh, many joined us. We had all together, I would say, uh, about 250 people. And on the other side, there was about 500. We had uh, Christian groups that joined us as well. And uh, a number of bloggers that uh, assist us and uh, document and photo uh, the events. So that it got a lot of attention. 
Yeah, the internet, we're living on an internet. Was the incident reported adequately? I think it was underreported. It was in one or two newspapers. But yeah, not the national newspaper. Yeah, that, that may be, but we're living, uh, you know, in an internet age, and uh, the information travels uh, on various blogs and reaches a, a significant audience uh, worldwide. So we have an impact uh, all over the world. We affect the way people think and feel in different countries, and some people are, many people actually are waking up. I get the emails from people in various countries. What's next on your plate? Next on our plate, uh, on September 11th, we're going to have a memorial, uh, candlelight to memorial uh, event uh, at uh, Eglinton and Kennedy Road to uh, highlight the victims of 9-11 and uh, to push for the, uh, uh, to draw attention to the issue of Omar Khadr. Uh, he was an Al-Qaeda terrorist that uh, killed Americans, an admitted Al-Qaeda terrorist. His father was... Uh, very close to Osama bin Laden, so we want to draw a spotlight on that issue that uh, he should not be welcomed back to Canada. Because he is trying to come back to Canada. He wants to come He's back. He has, he has supporters here, and uh, there's a whole network of uh, terrorist supporters in Canada, and uh, him coming back to Canada would just uh, aggravate the situation much more. All right. Good luck, and thank you for coming on today, Mayor. Thank you very much. Mayor Weinstein, head of JDL. Professor Uriel Leviathan, who is not only a world-renowned expert on the kibbutz, but also belongs to a kibbutz, Kibbutz Ein Hamifratz. Is the kibbutz dead? Is it dying? And what's happening today? Kibbutzim, many kibbutzim went through major transformations during the last 15, 20 years. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and many of them, in some eyes, are... Uh, I mean, when you come across a cash register in the Khadr Ochel, doesn't that tell you that it's over? Well, not really. Uh, if that's a defining uh, characteristic of kibbutz, then we would be in trouble. Or is it changing? It is... No, uh, I started to say that uh, major, uh, many kibbutzim went through major transformations. And so, so deep were the transformations that for some, I considered them no more a kibbutz in the sense that I understand what a kibbutz is. Which is Which communal is living, an intentional communal living, community. Equality, that's the basic and the most important aspect. Once a kibbutz uh, has its members uh, getting differential salaries that are uh, a function of their office or their job. And rather than everybody gets what they need, which is the original that, idea. Or, uh, or equal uh, shares, then it ceases to be a kibbutz. So in that sense, many kibbutzim have ceased to be a kibbutz in my sense, not in their own. They call themselves renewed kibbutzim. And they say that there are many ways to express the ideas of a kibbutz, uh, even though you do not keep to the uh, strict sense of democracy, strict sense of equality. So about 75% of all kibbutzim are now in this arrangement. But that leaves 25%. That leaves 25%. And not only the 25% that are left, some of them will eventually transform also because they are there because they have not transformed yet. But, but are there some, new kibbutzim in the collective sense, in the, in the so traditional me, sense? Yeah. So first there is what uh, is called the communal stream, Zer uh, Mashitufi in Hebrew, which are... Uh, uh, it consists of about 30 kibbutzim that intentionally keep on being communal kibbutzim. They have organized themselves into a small uh, uh, federation. In addition to that, there is a revival of the idea of the kibbutz by young people. Uh, there are about close to 2,000 
individual uh, individuals. And young. your son Lior is one of them, isn't he? That's true, and he's 30. He's not among the oldest. In some other youth movements, there are older uh, kids. But uh, in the Shomer Tzair, which he is a member of, uh, he is among the oldest and the leadership of that uh, direction. And they have just established a new kibbutz about a month ago. 30 young people, 25 to 30. Is All it of a them... kibbutz in the original sense of the kibbutz? Yes so, and no. Uh, is, it, is it different? Yes and no. Uh, they all belong to what they call the educators' movement. They believe that in order to change society, Israel's society, you have to invest in education. So they consider themselves, all of them, educators. They work with kids all over the country, particularly in the cities, but also in Kibbutzim. And uh, many of these groups live in the cities, as communes in the cities. So the kibbutz idea in the country, based on agriculture, which was the original kibbutz, is being transferred to the city well, in the form of communes, <laughs> urban communes. Well, anecdotally, my own kibbutz, Eda Mifratz, that uh, its first founders came in 1930 in Israel. Their idea was to be a city kibbutz. They had construction teams. They built several buildings in Haifa. They worked in factories. The idea was that we'll work with the proletariat in Haifa and lead it towards the revolution. So for about three, four years, until I think 1935, they were in the Haifa, where there is a big hospital in Haifa, Rambam. That's where they were. They really believed that they will be a city kibbutz. So in this sense, the grandchildren of those founders are not very different. But it's true that uh, So when you say they're educating, they, they see their role not just as kibbutzniks, not just being on the kibbutz or the commune, but as educators, what are they, what message are they trying to, to deliver? What are they trying to teach? Well, the basic principles of kibbutz life, that's equality, uh, uh, opportunities for, uh, they work, many of them work uh, in uh, areas of new immigrants, Ethiopians, Russian, uh, in rundown uh, neighborhoods uh, like Jesse Coyle in Hulon, Jaffa, uh, Lior's group was for three, almost three years. So they rented a house in Jaffa. And did what exactly? But, but let's, I, I, let's hold that for just a moment, and we'll be back with the kibbutz today. Dr. Uri Leviathan and the kibbutz today. Before we go to the kibbutz today and its transformation, why did such a, 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 an integral part of society, of Israeli society, fail or get diminished? Yeah. Well, the way I see it and the way our research points out, the way I interpret the findings of the research, is that the reason kibbutzim have transformed is because their members didn't want to continue to live kibbutz life. Collective that, life. That is not because of economic reasons, not because of environmental reasons, but because ideologically they didn't, they were, they, they were not committed to the ide idea, ideology? ideology of the kibbutz, the basic values of the kibbutz. Uh, fact is that those kibbutzim who stayed uh, still communal, I would call them traditional kibbutzim, are doing much better economically, are doing much better demographically. Uh, their members are uh, much uh, more satisfied with their life on the kibbutz as compared to those who are already differential. Yet, they don't want to be kibbutz members, but indeed, uh, why should they? 
if there is no strong emphasis on education. Yeah, was that a failure of education on the kibbutz? Did you just assume uh, the kids would soak it up? Yes, or yes. In fact, there was I, not intentional. In fact, theoretically, the theoreticians of kibbutz education stated this exactly as you said it. They were Marx, Marx, Marxists. And they said, well, the conditions are such that uh, it will go via genes, via the DNA. With the air, it will come. But it doesn't, because Tibbutz ideology is in an intellectual ideology. You have intellectually, philosophically, agree with the statement that to each according to one's needs, which means that if you yourself have many resources, personal resources, you're going to share with others. But you cannot, you will not want to share with others unless you have the same common denominator at the value level. Because why should I share with someone that I don't know uh, that I am not a friend of, that I am not a family member of, that uh, I don't consider that we are going to have uh, mutual, uh, uh, mutual gains from the partnership if there is no basic uh, values that we share. There are no basic values that we so share. And that, you can point that the finger at the kibbutz education system that it did education, not instill education, consciously that education, ideology. Education in the very general sense, not only what is taught at school, but also how the kibbutz, what are the priorities that the kibbutz is leading? Are the priorities, uh, how are we going to satisfy the basic needs or uh, the psychological needs the best we can? Or are we going to fulfill some uh, aspired goals beside those that are just desired But needs? all this transition to the privatization was a very disturbing factor in your own personal existence because you and your family still believe in the kibbutz. And yet you were living on kibbutz Ein Hamifratz in the throes of privatization. What was that like? Well, we had to decide uh, whether we are going to leave the kibbutz. At one time we thought perhaps we'll go to another kibbutz. And then we said if we are not able to change the course that our own kibbutz is taking, who promises us that we'll be able to keep the, course, the same course no on another No guarantees on another kibbutz. So, you know, I spent five years fighting uh, the, other, uh, the other ideology. Uh, not myself, uh, not only myself. Uh, there have been about 150 people uh, on our kibbutz, which is 400 people strong. But we were the mi minority, and we were not able to change the course of things. So, we so that's hope a sad thing for you and the other 150 and hundreds across Israel. It's a sad. You know, personally, we gained that material, like because I'm do I'm making a very good salary, and. I, beca I became rich during those uh, years that I... Because before you gave it all to the kibbutz, yes, and now yes, you keep it yes. for yourself. But I, I will say I'm ready to go back to the 1,700 shekels a month that we got and live the life that I consider to be the right kind of life. But my son, Lior, uh, he wouldn't... Uh, we were trying very hardly to persuade him and his group to join enemy frauds unsuccessfully. All right, we'll find out why Lior did not join and why his group decided to go he off on their own. Well, they don't believe it has a future. In a minute. Your son left the kibbutz 
because he didn't believe it had a future. He didn't believe if he stayed, he could change it back to the classical idea of kibbutz. What's different about what they're doing now? Well, in my view, they are mistaken. They should have joined kibbutzim like ours. Because once, part of the reason kibbutzim deteriorated was because the older people my age lost hope. They looked at the young people on their kibbutz and said, they don't want it. But if a group of 10 kids, like my son's uh, group, joins a kibbutz like ours, it transforms the whole thing. It's like a boost of energy, a boost of hope to everyone. The, the eyes would be lifted, the hearts would be lifted. I'm not able to persuade them, and, I'm, and uh, they say, we'll start again. We'll start anew. Now, you should remember that Kibbutzim started with 12 people in 1910. So it's not that Kibbutzim were all, 19 people, 12 people in 1910, aged 20 years old. So it's not that Kibbutzim were always populated by old people uh, using the, the electrical carts uh, like you see in uh, some... Uh, and they are the same. Trouble is that they are going to repeat probably most of the mistakes that the old Tibutim did. Um, and if they were to join a Tibutim like ours, they could continue from where we are and move it in other directions. That's not happening. Maybe it will still happen, uh, but uh, it's not happening at the moment. What's interesting is that they're not content to build their own kibbutz, which is an uh, enormous task in itself, but they're reaching out to Israeli society. I think you mentioned that they were the leaders in the social protest <coughs> that's going on now. Well, not so much leaders as organizers. They kept uh, themselves at the background because at that time it was a decision not to make it political. And once they appear with the blue shirts, it's very political, it's labor oriented. <clears throat> but they were organizers. Uh, they even collected money. Uh, I sent uh, letters, That's, they sent letters to everyone they knew and we contributed. And I sent letters to all my friends uh, and family abroad in different countries who sent money to help out the pro protest. They didn't have money for the buses, they didn't have money for... But they were very strong in the organization uh, because that really fit their idea of social justice. What lessons have we learned from this enormous way of life that perhaps the noblest way of life in terms of goals of humanity that there ever was, this intentional community of people that devoted their lives and that was an integral part of Israeli society. The cream of the crop was always from the kibbutz in every area, the Air Force, the, the, the uh, leaders in, 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 in government. So what have we learned? Well, not, not only in this aspect, but also in take agriculture, farming, uh, probably the most advanced farming in the world in certain uh, branches. So has uh, Israel been trans touched in any way? What have we learned from well, the kibbutz? Well, I think uh, the first lesson is that it is possible. <clears throat> now, the ideas of the kibbutz look as if it's impossible. Uh, many people say it's against human nature. But what's human nature? This has existed for 102 years by now, four different generations. And it's possible. The second lesson is that perhaps you, can, you cannot, uh, or only a very select group, could live the kibbutz life with all its aspects. But 
many aspects can be adapted by the society at large without such as being what? Such as what? Well, for instance, we were probably the first to introduce uh, no retirement. People would work to the very, very old age. Uh, I mean, very old age, like 90, like 100. And uh, now many societies are adopting the idea that people can continue to work in, uh, in different, we, uh, we introduced it that people continue to work, but with a difference that is less number of hours per day, less days per week, uh, more uh, 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 jobs that are more suited to the changing uh, uh, skills or changing possibilities of older people. Uh, we have now said to say the kibbutzim that are transforming are introducing um, a forced retirement on their older uh, members. Uh, we have introduced an educational system that, you know, according to all experts, it's probably one of the best systems. Still today, that's the case. fact is that many Israelis are ready to pay money for their children to be part of our education system from the cities. All right. Our time is up. Okay. It's not over. Well, I'll it's tell you one, one sentence. Uh, since many Jews will be watching this, uh, they probably know Hillel, Rabbi uh, Hillel, the old Rabbi Hillel, who said to the Gentile who asked him, how can you teach me the Torah standing on one leg? And he said, thou should uh, love. Uh, now, in fact, you shouldn't do to your uh, neighbor what you don't like to be done to you. And the rest is commentary and goes, go and study. So I'll finish with this. The rest go and study about the you. Thank you and good luck. I don't think it's over. I think it's changing, but the impact from what I hear about your son is still happening and perhaps will continue on in a diminished form. Thank you again. All right, should we get the show underway, people? You guys ready to get the show started? Then put your hands together and welcome to the stage your host and MC for this evening, Mr. Howard Dover. Let's hear it for Howard Dover. One more time, Howard Dover. And I'm Howard Dover. Welcome tonight to the show. <laughs> for the five of you who don't know. And you're Howard Dover. I am indeed. I never, I never get tired of watching that little clip. <laughs> it always amuses me to know. And Jean Paul, nice to meet. Just you. back from performing in Israel and Jordan. That's correct. You've both been doing comedy for years, years mm -hmm. and years. And yet, Howard, you've written a book called "Are You Sure This Is What You Want to Do?" It's uh, for people who are aspiring to be comics, and uh, they can read it, and hopefully, it'll try to talk them out of pursuing it. Well, what keeps you going? Uh, I want to say stupidity, uh, what comes to mind. It, it's just something that, that's inherent. I don't know. It's just something you, you have to do, you want to do, it feels right. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's just something you want think, to be doing. I think it's, uh, in, in our instance, I think it's uh, what you call, a, it's a calling. You know, and some people are called to the cloth and some people, and, and I, we're just called to the stage. So. You're just back from performing in Israel yes. and Jordan. Yes. Our audience is different there. Is there humor? Did they respond the same way as audiences here? The, the, uh, my biggest regret um, in being there was uh, the majority of audiences we perform for seem to be expats of either the United States or, or Canada, which was fine. Um, they were still Jewish. Uh, but um, I wish we had more inherent um, Israeli audiences because I really wanted to measure up what my material would have, you know, come across to them. 
Uh, the only time we really got to have some real Israeli, um, you know, people were in uh, in Tel Aviv, and there they also had uh, other Israeli comedians, and there, the comedy there is uh, is much more physical, uh, almost like French comedy, uh, which I thought was really really cool. Slapstick. I wouldn't go. Some of it was slapstick, and some of it was a lot of actions, and so and, broader, and, not, and, not as subtle. Or were, were comedians <clears throat> falling down on the ground? Um, not almost, <laughs> almost, but no, not as subtle, not as subtle, but but still very funny. Like I mean, comedy. What I love about comedy is there's such a full spectrum of it that it, it depends on what makes you laugh. It, it doesn't make anyone a better comic because I'm subtle or because you're political or because you're funny is funny. Yeah, I I think funny is to who it, if it speaks to you, it's funny. So I but I usually allow people to express themselves any way they want to. I'm not really a huge person to judge and go, that wasn't funny. So it just depends. The amazing thing that I, about your book is where you guys perform. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from a laundromat to a bar <laughs> to a bowling alley, you'll go anywhere. Absolutely. And, um, and why not? Stage time is stage time. And... Uh, an opportunity to just work on your material is an opportunity to work on your material. So why say no? I, I think one of the, uh, and I mentioned this in the book, one of my worst nightmares were, in talking about Judaism was uh, working at a bar mitzvah. Like, you know, they, they, it was a party, at the evening party, and they thought, you know, let's hire a comic. So you're, you're trying to address and amuse 12 and 13 year olds. Meanwhile, you have all these boobies and zadies sitting behind them, and you know, you have to find that fine line of tastefulness and did and you find it? Uh, I, I missed it at times. I missed my mark a few times. It was it was rough. I, I would have to say it was probably the one of my least, you know, um, favorable memories of doing comedy. But you know, I did it. I survived it, and it was a it was a experience. And I I would do it again, quite frankly. And what about you? What what's your toughest audience been? Um, God, I'd probably say it's along the same lines as 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 uh, Howard's example. Uh, it wasn't a bar mitzvah, though. Uh, <laughs> there were no boobies. Uh, I, 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 my background is uh, West Indian and Caribbean, and as you, as they're very um, un-North American in the sense that here, uh, sometimes people are okay with um, adult, you know, uh, in the Caribbean is a lot of language, a lot, a lot of double entendre, you know, a lot of... Um, you know, implied but not really stated right out. So sometimes when I have to do those cultural shows, it's a little tougher for me because I almost feel, I think comedy for me anyway is about expressing yourself and when you can't express yourself the way you want to express yourself, sometimes I just feel handcuffed and, and uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of uh, as, as a person of color, of being handcuffed on any level, so. <laughs> do, Canadians, <laughs> do Canadians appreciate humor? Canadians? I, I, I totally think they Are do. They good Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Canadians Absolutely. have a great sense of humor. I just think Canadian people sometimes, I don't know whether you'll agree, because I mean we perform for a lot of the same audiences. Sometimes Canadians in general, not just com comedy-wise, tend to be reserved and, and very polite. You know, and just <laughs> at least they don't throw things at you. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> well, though, there have been incidents. Yes, yes. Uh, seriously? Yes. Sure. Oh, yeah. We, we have a friend. common friend who's uh, had been class, assaulted class. twice. The same guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can say his name, Darren. Darren Frost. Yeah, he's he's had a uh, literally uh, a cup thrown at him at stay on Hit stage. Hit him right in the gut. You can even yeah. hear the air coming out of his. <laughs> I've of had his a friend uh, who had a beer bottle thrown at him, um, and luckily the person was a bad aim, and it hit the side of uh, where he was standing, but I mean, yeah. Another he, comic out west was on stage, and two guys came up to attack him, and luckily he'd been in the army and threw mm -hmm. them both off stage. There's when been, we come been back... I'd like to find out if American audiences are different, if their sense of humor is different, and more about your medical marijuana extravaganza. Absolutely. Say that again. Say that again. Extravaganza. I love it. <laughs> back in a minute. <laughs>
it's a comedy show first and foremost, but it's to help raise awareness of the benefits of medical marijuana. I'm, a, I'm an activist. I truly believe in the med medicinal benefits of medical marijuana. But what's funny about it? What's not funny about marijuana? <laughs> yeah. it, it just it enhances every every experience possible. So um, I think the two go hand in hand quite well. And I've been doing these shows uh, around North America, and they become quite successful. Um, if anyone's interested, they can check HowardDover.com to see when the next show's coming up. Um, Jean Paul's been on a few of them, mm -hmm. and um, they're great. They're give enjoyable. us a sample. Give us a sample of. Of marijuana. Medical marijuana. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. You want a joint? What do you mean? Do you want a sample? What, 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 a, what kind a of joke? humor? A joke. Well, um, the, the, the humor is pretty much the same. I mean, you, you're just allowed to. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one of the the, the jokes yeah. I had was um, uh, I talk about being in in BC, and um, if you've ever gone to BC, you should try it because it's it's known for you know it's it's marijuana, it's world renowned, uh, but just don't smoke with in a car and drive because it's very dangerous um, because everything you know becomes literal we were driving on our way to penticton bc and i saw a road sign that said turn off two kilometers and we drove a little further and hitchhiking at the side of the road was this really overweight dude in a thong bikini it was just horrible so um, <laughs> Over, uh, so it, was you turn, it was a turn off it was a turn off it was an overweight guy in a thong bikini hitchhiking <laughs> so but when you're high you know <laughs> It makes sense. When you're not high, you're just like, this guy's an idiot. So That's why I went by the name Serotonin Levels. That's my uh, weed name. How about uh, marijuana mentioned in the Bible? It says, let he who sinned be stoned. Oh. Well, there you go. Some of them were stoned to death. Yes. yes. So. You're Jewish. You're not Jewish, but you're dark. I will be, though, in, uh, in about <laughs> half an hour. I'm on the way to Lens Crafters. You're black. And you're Jewish. Is that a problem? Has that been ever a problem? I didn't know he wasn't Jewish till now. So, I'm <laughs> so quite he needs, he, he yeah. needs a moment. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think it's ever been a problem for me. It's probably I'd, I'd like to say it's a problem for other people sometimes. Um, I, I, I'm, I know I'm black. I've always been black. I, I, you know, it's not like I woke up one morning like, oh my god, <laughs> you know. So um, some people I think just have their own views of what they think. You know whether you're what Jewish people are like should be but like. But have you been attacked, <clears throat> insulted, because of this part of your identity? Oh yeah, I mean, on stage, off stage. Uh, sometimes people just have really weird preconceived notions. It's funny sometimes um, before I speak. Uh, a perfect example. I was in Florida, uh, and I always forget Florida is the South. I just think Florida is hot, beaches, you know, you go to have a good time. And I ended up going to, uh, I was at a bar, it was a karaoke night, and I ended up going to the bathroom just to use the bathroom. And uh, I was, there was a lineup for the urinals. And this one guy was a white dude, American, he was drunk. And he happened to turn around and see me uh, just waiting to use the bathroom, like, you know, because I had some excess liquid I needed to get rid of. And uh, immediately he launched into, let me help you here, brother, and all this kind of like really over the top kind of, you know, uh, stereotypical, yeah, you know, over the top jargon, you know, and like, but that's not how I speak. And, uh, but the weirdest part was when I went back outside uh, and I was sitting where I was sitting, I could see him at the bar, then talking to his friends, trying to get them to like, look at him over there. And da -da and pointing and, 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 you know, with the scowl on his face and stuff like that. But his friends, I could also kind of semi-read their lips, and they were looking over going, but he's not doing anything. He's just <laughs> sitting there. And he was just like, no, but look at him over there. <laughs> just sitting there. Just he like. wanted to get me. So I think he wanted to get you me. You didn't feel threatened, though, I hope. I didn't feel threatened, um, but I, I, you, you then tend to, you know, be a little more aware of your surroundings. So it's like, all right, if anything were to happen, you know, what are my, what's my contingency? Do I go this and, way? And, and on that, that way? same thing, I also when I've been down in the deep south, I don't really bring up Judaism. <laughs> you know, I'll just skip a little portion of my jokes. You know, no sense bringing that up either. It's much for the same reason. And I think it's when people don't have uh, have reference points. They make up. They either make it up or they go by what they maybe see on TV or, or think. You know, it's supposed to be. But you know, ignorance is ignorance, and I, I more feel sorry for ignorant people than someone who's Jewish or black or. But you're public figures, both of you. <clears throat> 
if that's in the air, then there's an element of protectiveness. You're careful. Howard, you say in the South you don't mention anything Jewish? No. There's no need to. I have other things I can but talk why? about. But why? Why? Why do you avoid that? Because uh, of the, the ignorance and their preconceived, you know, and I, I, why get them thinking and, and, and instead of following my pattern, now all of a sudden they're on, you know, they get hung up on something. They get hung up on the Jewish aspect and uh, not necessary. Don't say hung up around the black end. <laughs> I hung <So>. down. <laughs> In Israel, was being black an issue or um, a non-issue? I would say it was a non-issue. No one, no one really, uh, with the exception of a, a few of the, the extremely pretty girls coming up to me, and, and uh, the, the best pickup line was, you look like Yemen Jew. <laughs> that, was a, that was the best pickup line uh, ever. Um, I, it wasn't a problem. No one treated me different. I didn't feel any different. There were a lot of, um, you know, uh, the, the cool thing that I found out about Israel once I was there, it's, it's almost like, uh, it's, it's like the homeland. So all different, and, and everyone is invited to come home if you want. You know what I mean? You could be from America and, and move back to Israel or Canada or Yemen or Russia or Poland. It's just if you're Jewish and you want to come home, Come on home. Uh, so there, there. But uh, it was awesome to see all the different shades and, and types of of Jewish people, from the black to the light skin to the dark skin to the redheads to the brunettes to the blondes to the you know the very short, the very tall. Um, so it was really cool, and it reminds me. I'm originally from uh, an island called Trinidad and Tobago, which actually celebrates our 50th anniversary of independence tomorrow. It's very similar. Our our race mixture um, is 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 much like that. So you kind of felt at home in Israel. Is That's that what I. Uh, eventually on stage, that's, that's what I told them. I was like, uh, you know, it's, it's so, everyone here is so confused. You don't know what a, a, a real Jew is. It's like <laughs> I feel right at home, you know, because it's, it's amazing. All right. I thank you both for coming, Howard Dover and Jean-Paul. Yes. And remember to be a mensch. <laughs>